thank our sponsors, Mickey Fins, Marlboro PD Electric, Schofields, Carolina Bank, Pepsi of Florence. Welcome to another edition. I don't know why I say welcome to another edition of No Stop Lights. I mean, if you're watching it, you know what you're watching. You didn't just randomly stumble upon this feeble attempt at podcasting. I do want to thank our sponsors. Uh, once again, Mickey Fins, Marlboro PD Electric Co-op, Schofields Ace Hardware, Carolina Bank, Pepsi of uh, Florence. There are a lot of complicated arguments to make surrounding the two stories that are probably as two prominent. I mean, these stories separate of one another are as prominent as any political story come down the pike in recent memory. Take the fact that they're both running at about the same time, complementary or parallel with one another, and then add the component. These are the two front runners, one a sitting president, one a former president um, currently running for the Republican um, nod in the Republican primary. So there are a lot of complexities, a lot of uh, complications within this um, this interesting uh, conundrum and debate. But, but I, I want to break it down the best I know how, but because I think we've got we've to ask ourselves, are we more interested in the legal ramifications or the politics? I mean, the, 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 the legal ramificate, ramifications are you've got a, I'll use the New York Times word, a stinging indictment of 31 counts, willful retention of classified national security information, five counts of obstruction of justice, one count of conspiracy to obstruct justice, um, and, and you got a, a lot of um, the unsealing of the indictment that happened uh, toward the end of last week. You've got a, um, I mean, this is Monday, we're recording for Tuesday, so you'll have a, an arraignment tomorrow in Miami. So let's let's hold on to the the legal framework. The legal framework is for the first time in American history, a president, former president of the United States is being indicted or has been indicted by the federal government. Uh, but that that's the macro of all macros. Once again, a former president of the United States for the first time in American history has been indicted by the federal government. That that is the that that is the critical legal theory of what got us here. Now, once again, um, whether it's a stinging indictment or a um, you know a uh, an overwhelming uh, demonstration of Trump's reckless uh, recklessness and carelessness, you've got 31 counts of willful retention of classified national security, um, and then a conspiracy account, obstruction account. I said last week. I don't know that I said on the podcast. But I said last week that the word willfully would probably become uh, an important word. Um, Grossly negligent would be a couple of other words to be considered. Inadvertent would be another word you hear bandied about by legal minds and legal professionals, depending on what side of the equation you're on. And if you're on America first, you're on on Trump's, excuse me, the, the only people that are on Trump's teams are on Trump's team in regards to this latest episode of Trump and the federal government are, are the America firsters. So, so, so let's for, for, for a second, let's forget. I mean, it's, it's, it's not possible because it is the overwhelming sentiment of the case. The fact that there is now an indictment of a former president. It's not a rumored indictment. It's not CNN, um, you know, saying that Trump did this or did that. It's not MSNBC saying one thing. It's not Fox news running interference or the American conservative or, or national review. I mean, we have a, a formal indictment, a formal arraignment awaits, a formal trial will eventually um, take place. The guy will be under invest. Excuse me. The, the, the guy's already been under investigation multiple times. He will be faced with a trial while running for president of the United States. So, so, so we've got to make a determination. Uh, you don't have to, but I think it's interesting to try and do this. Is the, the, the political story more interesting and important than the legal story? Now, if you ask Trump, winning the election or losing the election does not put his reputation nor freedom at risk. I mean, there, there is, there, there's one scenario out there that has Trump being convicted of all counts, including the Espionage Act, and Trump goes to prison. I mean, you know, I read an account this morning, there, there's a potential 400 years of incarceration to be run consecutively one of another. I mean, I don't believe that's going to happen. You don't believe that's going to happen, but it's on the table. I mean, you know, there, there are charges here that if, if prosecuted to the full extent of the law could land Trump in jail, what he's 76 or seven now, 
I mean, he could die in prison. I mean, I, I don't think that is going to be considered, but but it's it's got to be on the table. But but I want to go back to the political story because I think this is what I find so compelling and interesting and where I think the majority of Americans are. And ah, let me back up. The overwhelming majority of Republicans are and a, a plurality of Americans, not, not an overwhelming plurality, uh, but, but a lot of Americans believe, well, I'll give you a number. 60% of Americans today believe Donald Trump committed a crime. If mishandling classified information is a crime, Donald Trump committed a crime. Now, now we'll get to um, the two-tiered system of justice. We'll get to the, um, to the, the double standard that we believe applies in this case. But, but I want to get to kind of the, the, the entanglement, the intertwinement of the, the trial to be, the, 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 the legal narrative and how it affects the eventual campaign, and how I think America First and Donald Trump could be served well by playing it um, this way. The, 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 there will be a lot of conversations. And once again, they'll be extremely complicated. What exactly is your interpretation of the Presidential Records Act? What exactly is your interpretation of uh, the, the Espionage Act? I'll read uh, an interesting paragraph of the Espionage Act. Um, let's put that on, on the table first. Let's, let's go down the road. The most egregious charge that Donald Trump has is violation of the Espionage Act. The Espionage Act says mishandling any information relating to the national defense with intent or reason, there's that interesting word, intent again, or reason to believe that the information may be used for the injury to the U.S. or to the advantage of any foreign national. Let, let's make an assumption. Let's say that Trump doesn't give a rat's ass about authority. Trump does what Trump wants to do. And Trump had classified documentation. And Trump, you know, he doesn't drink, but, but Trump is a little bit full of himself one night at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, in comes a couple of his big shot buddies, and Trump says, hey, come over here a minute. Let me show you something. And he shows some of these um, sensitive materials to people who have no business seeing it. Is that still, I mean, let's go back to the language, reason to believe, or excuse me, relating to the national defense with intent or reason to believe that the information may be used for the injury to the U.S. and for any advantage of a, national, of a foreign national. I mean, do we really believe that Trump, no, no matter how narcissistic, how, how you know, um, non-answering to authority he is, do, do any of you out there believe, however afflicted you may be with, with the Trump derangement syndrome, do you believe he's not a patriot? I mean, I, I would accept he's not a good rule follower. I would accept he doesn't answer to authority very well. But, but the word here is intent. When you talk about the Espionage Act, intent or reason to believe that the information may be used for the injury to the United States. Does anybody out there believe that Donald Trump intentionally tried to harm the United States of America? No. I mean, the, guy, the, the, the only problem he's ever had with the government of Florida that I know of is the American flag in his yard's too big. I mean, I think he's had an issue with city or state government about the size of the flag. Donald Trump has been questioned uh, by, by his motivations on a lot of fronts. I, I, I think if you question his inability to constrain himself at times, very guilty as charged. Inability to follow rules and regulations as prescribed, probably guilty as charged. But I think to suggest... That, that Donald Trump is a traitor or treasonous is an absolute overcharge. So, so if I'm Trump or I'm his legal team, and I'm thinking about legalities and politics here, um, kind, of, kind of intertangled or intertwined, entangled one with another, I'm starting to think about this charge espionage. And, and, and I, I would make a big deal of that. And I would say, look, I'm a lot of things. I'm not a traitor. I would never, ever forsake the safety or best interest of America. And, and I would hang my hat there. Now, once again, there will be complicated, ambiguous debates. There will not be certainty of answer. There, there will be, you ready for a technical word? There will be squishiness involved in, you know, whether Trump could do this or whether he could do that or whether the indicting document is um, witch hunting or is it legitimately in pursuit of the truth. But there'll be a lot of conversations centering around that. But, but if I'm Trump, I mean, I don't blow that off, but I am insulted that anybody would ever believe that, that I would forsake the best interests of America by allowing people to get their hands on this material 
that may wish to cause America harm. I just think you're going to have a hard time convincing Americans. Now, now if you hate Trump to the extreme degree, I mean, you think he's the Antichrist incarnate. But, but I, I just think reasonable people that may not even like Trump would say, I don't know about that, man. I mean, you're just trying to tell me the guy's not patriotic. You're trying to get, tell me the guy's somewhat of a traitor, that he was on the take for some foreign government. I mean, we've got a president now that we think might be on the take of a foreign government, but his name's not Donald Trump. We'll get to that in a later podcast with the Biden, you know, the, the LLCs and the shell companies. And anyway, I th- we think they're investigating that. Maybe an indictment's uh, impending. Maybe not. We, we shall see how that works out. But, but, but I think the Espionage Act is the easiest for Trump to argue in opposition of. There is no way that I would have ever done anything intentionally to put America at risk. That, that's not the definition of the Espionage Act, but, but we're not, the majority of consumers of this story will not be legalese. They, they won't be um, law professors at Harvard or Yale or Stanford or Duke or, uh, you know, have these intellectual faculty lounge debates. That There will be real people trying to reasonably consider what the charges are. And I think it's going to be fairly easy for Trump to convince people, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a traitor. I'm not a spy. I, I didn't personally gain or benefit by selling America's secrets to a foreign national or someone who wishes to cause us um, grave harm. Now, let's go to the other extreme. To, to me, the lesser of all the charges, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a judge, I don't have any idea how this plays out, but at first glance, the lesser of all the charges is the willful retention of classified national security information. If I'm Trump, or if I'm Trump's legal team, as much as I vehemently oppose what they're accusing me of when it comes to the um, Espionage Act, I accept some, some responsibility. I probably did retain willfully some classified material or documentation that should not have been in my possession. I think I may have done that. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure I did it because I asked my lawyers, let's go back and look at the Hillary Clinton president. I mean, how did Hillary deal with that? How, how, did, how did George W. Bush deal with that? How did Barack Obama deal with that? How did Bill Clinton deal with that? Did, did, did they willfully retain classified information? Were they in violation of the Presidential Records Act? We think they were. So, so I think that really allows him to say, why am I the first person to ever be charged with a crime, indicted of a crime, and 31 of the charges are the willful retention of classified national security information? Um, let's go back to Ms. Clinton for a second. We know that she had a server in a private residence. We know she hired um, a, 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 a computer specialist to wipe clean some of the data on the hard drive. We know that some uh, employees of the Clinton campaign destroyed uh, digital cell phones, social media devices with hammers. I mean, I'm talking about physically destroyed the, the equipment. That's pretty wild. And, um, you know, if, if you believe, because I wrote these two words down, I want to make sure I get them right here. Uh... I got him somewhere. Here we go. Here we go. Um, grossly negligent. There are a lot of people. I mean, if you think, t- t- take this one word into willful or grossly negligent. How many times do you believe the Clintons have been grossly negligent? And how many times do you believe they've been willful? The Clintons have never done a damn thing inadvertently. I mean, everything they've ever done in their lives, politically, professionally, personally, has been very well thought out. They don't make it up as they go. So for you to believe that Donald Trump willfully retained um, 31 or 31 charges of willfully retaining classified national security information, but Hillary Clinton was grossly negligent? I mean, are we really going there? I mean, do you, do you really believe that, that, that Trump was willful and Clinton was inadvertent? I mean, Jim Comey said before the 2016 election, the lady broke the law. But the reason we're not charging and no prosecutor would bring charges is she was grossly negligent and not willful. Well, it's hard for you'll have a, a hell of a time convincing me that the Clintons do things just to be doing things. I mean, everything in their life is as calculated as any one or two people in the history of mankind. So, so, and here's the point I'm trying to make. I think if you passionately defend your honor, your name, your reputation, your patriotism, or the Espionage Act, you can fall on the sword. I understand there are a lot of Trumpsters who say the American, excuse me, the Presidential Records Act gives him some authority, some discretion, some leeway, some runway, some ambiguity 
on what he could or could not do. I mean, could he telepathically declassify material? I mean, he says that once or twice. It's just a bit odd that, that he would argue that point. But, but I just think there's political points to be scored by saying, hey, I may have retained some of this national security information that was classified. I, I, I probably shouldn't have had that in my possession. But I look back at the way Bush did. I look back at the way Clinton did. I look back at the way Obama did. I look back at the way the former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton did. I look back at the way my Vice President Mike Pence did. I look back at the way the guy with the Corvette in the garage did. And I assume this is the way you do things. But now all of a sudden, I'm in court defending my name and honor and reputation when nobody else have ever, has ever had to explain themselves in a court of law when it comes to um, the, 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 the illegal retention of classified documentation. I, I just, and I understand, and here's where, here's where the, I mean, this is where the frustration I have with Trump. He's never wrong. He's never wrong. And that's a blind spot. Everybody has blind spots. I have a blind spot. You have a blind spot. We all have multiple blind spots. I just think if Trump wants to be president again, and I want Trump to be president again, I want the Republican to be president. I want anybody not named Joe Biden to be president. I mean, I, I could live with Ron DeSantis. I could live with Tim Scott. I could live with, with Donald. I mean, there, there are several, Vivek Ramaswamy, I mean, there are several on the Republican side I could live with. There are a few I couldn't. But there, there's some I'm not excited at all about. But these who have bought into the America First agenda, the American First concept or ideal of America First, um, I could live with any of those. But I think it's more likely that Donald Trump is the nominee of the Republican Party. And I think it's more likely that Donald Trump wins the, the presidential process by showing a little humility and accepting some responsibility. I get that you say, well, I mean, why would you fall on that sword when nobody, and be the first one to ever, I just think there's some beauty in that. I think there's some, some, some room to be made, some gains to be made with what I call the Seinfeld watcher. We refer to those, I mean, Limbaugh called them low information voter. I refer to those as a Seinfeld voter. I think it's very easy to understand. And here's where we're going to get in trouble. I mean, those of us who do podcasts and host radio shows and and read the National Review every day and go to the New York Times every day and and see what the Wall Street Journal editorial board has to say, we're we're going to have a a, a much more in-depth understanding of the complications of this election cycle. And two of the biggest complications of this election cycle are going to be, one, the indictment of Donald Trump, and two, the eventual eventual, um, uh, discovery of what all Joe Biden did in regards to the transference of money, the bribery scheme. We'll find out as time progresses. You can't keep that, but so quiet for so long. So these are going to be, to to me, the two issues that the Seinfeld watchers are watching. I mean, obviously, they're going to be paying attention to inflation and crime and education and taxes and, you know, right track, wrong track. How do we feel about America and its future today? Biden is very pessimistic when it comes to that. Not a lot of voters in America today put faith in, in Joe Biden. But, but I think Donald Trump has a chance if he plays these cards right. And, and I know this sounds weird, but to take advantage of an indictment. The, 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 the data clearly shows, guys, 60% of Americans, it's a big number, 60% of Americans believe Donald Trump broke the law. I mean, do you think they're going to change their mind? Do you think a trial of Donald Trump is going to change their mind? No. I mean, they made their mind up. They believe Trump broke the law. They believe probably, I'm speculating here, they believe he probably willfully retained classified national security information and it was in violation of the Presidential Records Act, which basically transfers the, the, the ownership rights to these documents to the, to the government. I mean, in essence, it's a lot more complicated than that, but that would be the cliff note. Um, when a president leaves office, the material he accumulated dur- during his presidency does not belong to him, but, but rather the federal government. And there's kind of a back and forth. And, you know, when they build these libraries, what does the library get? What formality do they go through to make sure they are done the right way? Who safe keeps and safe houses? You've heard skiff the, these, um, the, these government approved safe houses that documents can or cannot be kept. But, but I'm talking about for, forget the legal debate. I mean, there will be a trial. I'll make this point. Thought about it this morning. I don't know of a better city I mean, if, you, if, if 60% of Americans believe that Donald Trump broke a law, 60% of Americans believe that Donald Trump 
is a victim of political persecution. I, mean, that, I don't know how you put that genie back in the bottle. I mean, you really don't. I mean, it, it's a very confused country right now. I mean, I, I'm glad it's confused because I think Americans are really beginning to wake up and sense that the, these conspiracy theorists that for a long time have said there's two tiers of justice, there's a double standard, and, and I've said it before, I'll say it again, we can debate education, we can debate tax policy, we can debate a lot of things within the government. When we pledge allegiance to the flag, I mean, we're talking about the equal application for liberty and justice for all, for liberty and justice for all. It's not whether you're Republican, whether you're Democrat, whether you're hell raiser, whether you aren't, whether you're rabble rouser, whether you aren't, whether you deal with authority a certain way or, or don't another way. And it really boils down to, I think personally, that there's a, a cartel of careerists who have assumed and amassed enormous influence over our federal government. And Trump doesn't play ball. He's an outsider. He's a, a, a rambunctious sort. And he threatens the, the system of government of which they've gained enormous control over. And there's an unbelievable amount of, of power, influence, and authority at stake here. Um, and, but, but, but I want to go back to the political story because, because, once again, I think we would all become and will become confused trying to follow a trial where they're debating exactly what the interpretation of the Presidential Records Act is. Some I mean, of the Trump's team will interpret it one way. The DOJ will interpret it another way. You get the Espionage Act. The Trump team will interpret it one way. Uh, that's why you have trials. That's why you have disagreements. That's why there are um, litigators extraordinaire in America today, and, and we litigate about everything in our country anyway. Why not litigate who should be the next president of the United States? But, but I want to go back to the point I tried to make before I kind of got off, off subject there. If, if 60% of Americans believe that part of the story is political persecution, I mean, that's not a conservative radio show host in South Carolina. I mean, 60% of Americans have answered a poll question, do you believe Trump is guilty of a crime? Yeah, probably. Do you believe Trump is being politically persecuted? Yeah, probably. I mean, those aren't mutually exclusive of one another. But if, but if a lot of this trial is going to hinge on, and a lot of the political opportunism it's going to hinge on whether or not Trump is getting a fair shake. Is Trump getting treated just like Hillary Clinton got treated? Is Trump getting treated like Bill Clinton, like George W. Bush, like Barack Obama, like Joe Biden? Hell no. I mean, nobody believes that. The 40% who answered that question that he's not being politically persecuted, I mean, they just hate Trump. I mean, we believe a third of the country are solidly in Trump's corner. A third of the country would vote for Attila the Hun. Or, or, or Vladimir Putin before they'd vote for, for Donald Trump. I mean, it's Trump derangement syndrome 101. But, but if you are going to be on trial and the central theme of your argument, once again, Espionage Act, no, absolutely not. Um, willfully retaining classified documents, probably. Obstruction of justice, you, 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 you make your best case, we'll make our best case and let a jury of our peers decide who's guilty and who's not. But, but think about this. If we believe that, that a large part of this case, and I do, and I think Lindsey Graham did a good job Sunday of pushing back on what I'll call the media narrative of, you know, they, they investigated Ms. Clinton, that they're investigating Joe Biden. I mean, if you believe they're putting forth the effort to investigate Joe Biden, to investigate Hillary Clinton, that they're putting to investigate um, Donald Trump, I got some oceanfront property in Arizona we'll talk about buying after the podcast. But the city of Miami is home to a lot of people who have fled communist regime. I'm talking about Cuban Americans in particular. And what is the likelihood of someone sitting on that jury whose family member at some point in time in their ancestry dealt with political oppression or political persecution? I mean, this is what they do. Because if you really boil this down, I mean, we're having a trial, or we will have a trial at some point in time. I call it political thuggery. Let's say you disagree with my uh, analysis that it's not political thuggery. It is the first time in American history, and it's only one of the few times in world history, that people who profess to be free and liberty lovers have a current president and his administration prosecuting one of his chief rivals I mean, that, that's a fact. I mean, you can say, yeah, but. Well, I mean, that, yeah, but. You know, if if and bus were candy nuts, every day would be Christmas. But, but, but in all reality, 
It's something you never imagined would happen in America. You, you've got a president of the United States who appoints an attorney general who has full control and autonomy over the Department of Justice, who has oversight over the FBI, who have concluded by the appointment of a special counsel and the, uh, the, the eventual indictment of a president. I mean, that, that's what happens in third world dictatorships. That's what happens in banana republics. No, that's what happened in the good old U.S. of A. And we've crossed the Rubicon. I mean, it's a shot across the bow. There's a million different ways to explain what, what has happened. But, but I just, I'd like to think, and maybe I'm being a bit too optimistic here. I'd like to believe that there's somebody in Miami that will be asked to sit on a jury. And when they're asked to sit on that jury, they'll bring, they'll bring the events and experiences of life as some family member told them life was. Why did you come to America, granddaddy? I came to America, son, to get away from political persecution and oppression. I came to America so everybody would be treated equally and fairly under the rule of law. That's what America's known for. Doesn't matter if you're Republican, a Democrat, a conservative, or liberal. This place is, is a shining city on it. It's a beacon of hope. It's, a, it's, it's an example to the rest of the world that we don't target our political opponents as criminals. We don't make up crimes and go after people because they may or may not be a threat to our standing in government, our control of government. And I, I just believe that the odds of that happening in Miami are much greater than the odds of that happening, obviously, in Washington or in Atlanta or in uh, name another American city, whatever. It's, uh, I mean, the, the trial will be in the Southern District of New York. New York, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, excuse, the Southern District of Miami, Florida. Uh, Miami, Florida. Right. Um, the, the others in New York. And there'll be another one. I mean, there'll be another trial in New York. There'll be another trial in Atlanta. I'm going to show the man. I'll show you. I'll show you the crime. And, uh, and, and but but I want to get back to the to, to the to the political story because I just think this is critically important. And I have no idea what Trump tells the nation tonight. I mean, I think he addresses the nation at some time in prime time tonight. This would be airing Tuesday. I think we're producing on Monday for for um what what do you call it? We, we drop it. I mean, I call it drop the podcast. Publish. Uh, publish a mm-hmm. podcast on on Tuesday. So the arraignment will be shortly after this podcast debuts. There will be an eventual address to the nation by former President Trump. Uh, I have no idea what he'll say, how his, how his response will be. I don't have any idea how America feels. I know how I feel. And, and I feel that Trump broke the law by willfully retaining classified information. I get the ambiguity of the Presidential Records Act. Uh, my sidekick in the morning, Dave Baker, and I've had this debate. Um, and, and I get that. I understand that. And but 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 I I just think taking responsibility of that invites and in, I, 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 in other words if if I'm guilty I'm admitting my guilt to willfully retaining classified information why am I the only one in a courtroom why was Miss Clinton not charged with a crime why was Barack Obama not charged with a crime why was Bill Clinton not charged with a crime why is Joe Biden not charged with a crime I mean of all the people we just mentioned. Only three of us had the right to declassify if we chose. Now, I think telepathically declassifying, that's a bit reachy, <laughs> but it's Trump. I mean, it's just the way Trump rolls. Trump abhors authority. He likes being in control. Certain aspects of his presidency, him, and he caused a lot of, of damage to himself because he didn't accept the fact that he's not in control of the entire government. I mean, when Trump runs Trump Enterprise, he runs it like he chooses. You can't run the federal government like that. So I think he's made some mistakes, and I think one of the mistakes he made was not working as complicitly, and, and, and the, the Trumpsters have to understand, and I'm a Trumpster. Let, let me rephrase that. We've got to understand that our guy's not perfect. And I think one, one, one sign of showing contrition, uh, I, I, it's not weakness. Stop with that. It's not weakness. It's not giving them anything. It's accepting responsibility that I, I held on to classified material Longer than I should have. Now, now I, I've got no problem with this. But the reason I did it is because the Clinton precedent and the Obama precedent and the Clinton. I never imagined I'd get charged with a crime because good God, look at what they did. And none of them ever got charged with a crime. And then we'll argue over, you know, conspiracy to obstruct, obstructing justice. I think he has sound footing there. Um, and, and if we've really gotten to a place in America today, we're, we're I mean, that that's the that's the. That's the uh, the threshold for indictment. Then I don't want to be president. I don't know anybody that would want to be president. 
because presidents are going to make mistakes. And would presidents make mistakes if the answer is indictment and criminality and lawsuits and charges? And I, I just, I, I don't know where we go from here. And, and once again, I go back to that statistic. 60% of Americans believe Trump broke the law. 60% of Americans believe that Trump is being politically persecuted. How do you square that? What is more important? Is it more important that a president willfully retains classified material or we have a double standard of justice? I mean, Trump will come and go, right? I mean, eventually, there is no more Donald Trump on the political scene. Who's the boogeyman then? I mean, who's the, 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 the legitimate threat? Because we've already proven, and, and I think Trump is right when he says this, and he says it a lot. I think Trump looks at the construction worker, the bus driver, the, the, the factory employee, the, um, I mean, the, those who just don't believe they have representation in the halls of Congress. They don't believe that Congress genuinely represents their best interests. Newsflash, nor do I. I've thought that for a long, 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 long time. The two, pol- the, the, the two political parties in America today don't exist to serve their constituency. I mean, they need your votes to put them in power, but at the end of the day, they have their special interest. And, and one is very sympathetic to the cause of government. I mean, liberal Americans are very sympathetic to government being in control. And, and Trump was not very sympathetic to government being in control. And Trump's voters are not very sympathetic to government being in control. But in closing, I just want to say, when, 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 we, when we have the arraignment tomorrow, which will be today, I mean, I keep getting crossed up here. No, no, we're not trying to mislead people and say, you know, we're doing a podcast live. We're not. We're doing a podcast one day and, and produce it the next day. But, um, but later today, when Trump is arraigned, and Trump addresses the country, it would be smart on my part if he were to say, you know, on these retention of classified material charges, I'm probably guilty. But I'm no more guilty than Hillary Clinton. I'm no more more guilty than George W. Bush. I'm no more guilty than Joe Biden. I'm no more guilty than than Mike Pence. I'm no more guilty than Barack Obama. But I'm in a courtroom and they aren't. And I want the American people to kind of understand that, that there's one person who, who you feel went to bat for folks who don't have a lot of uh, representation in the halls of Congress where these big decisions are made. I'm their guy. I mean, there's no doubt I'm their guy. You know I'm their guy. They know I'm their guy. You can like me being their guy. You can not like being there. You can say, I don't understand how they would buy into Trump's nonsense. Well, I mean, it doesn't matter what you think about it. I mean, it's a reality. And, and the ones that try to drive a wedge between Trump and his voting base to me – have endeared him even more to those loyal supporters. And it's not, I mean, this is so much bigger than Trump. And, and, and I think maybe this debate will show that, that, um, that you've got on one, in one corner, you, you've got Donald Trump, a, a, a political anomaly, a political unicorn, somebody who it's hard to explain how he's gotten where he has in, in the organized world of American, of American politics. But then you've got the American government. And I think, you know, if, if Donald Trump and his team can understand and I think they'll do this, that, that we're not only trying Donald Trump, we're trying the honesty and integrity of the federal government. I mean, Trump's here for a minute and gone tomorrow, right? Whether, whether he gets reelected president or not. We're 246 years into this experiment of man governing man. And for 246 years, we never did this. We never politically persecuted a rival candidate until now. I mean, it's very common in some of the third world dictatorships Pretty common in China, pretty common in Russia, but it didn't, aren't we expected to be different than that? So, so, so with the crux of the matter, it's unprecedented, and I do want to get to the Biden story because I think there's a lot of meat on that bone and a lot of explaining that Biden has to do other than, you know, where's the money and it's a bunch of malarkey. I mean, that's nonsense. I mean, that, that, that debate sir, deserves so much more consideration, but, but I do think doing a podcast on the day of a president being arraigned for the first time in American history. That, that's pretty odd. I mean, think about that, guys. Think about all the mistakes presidents have made in days gone by. Think about how many, uh, I'm thinking about Andrew Jackson. I'm, I'm thinking about some of the outrageous, uh, Lyndon B. John. I'm thinking about some of the characters, the real characters we've had in the White House. We've never, ever, ever had one indicted of a crime. Especially, not just indicted of a crime, indicted of a crime by an administration of a current president who will probably run against the guy that he's indicting of a crime. Liberty and justice for all, my ass. I want to thank our sponsors. Carolina Bank serves communities throughout northeastern South Carolina, offering a wide range of services to meet every personal or business need from straightforward accounts 
to complex finances. They're prepared to help you reach your financial goals. Carolina Bank, banking on tradition since 1936. Member FDIC Schofields, Ace Hardware, your one-stop shop for all hardware, paint and lawn and garden needs, plus all things sporting goods, including firearms, safes, clothing, footwear, and more. Pepsi of Florence represent the entire product line of PepsiCo, one of the world's leading food and beverage companies, Pepsi of Florence, also serve brands from other great companies such as Dr. Pepper, Canada Dry, Lipton Tea, Gatorade, and various regional brands. Mickey Finn's largest South Carolina liquor wholesaler, serving every county in the state, largest bourbon selection statewide. They ship wines to 43 states, opening soon a new beverage warehouse across from Bucky's on I-95 in Florence. They support USC athletics, including Williams, Bryce, and Colonial Life Arena. Marlboro PD Electric Co-op. If you're in big business and looking for an industrial park in the south to build your new plant, consider Marlboro PD Electric Co-op's new PD Commerce Center. Uh, an industrial park located at the I-95 exit in Florence, South Carolina. Check it out at MPDC Co-op or PDEC.com. <laughs> 